Hey, it's Craig Syracuse and welcome to another episode of Walk in Faith, the show where we go beyond the image and we discover who our guests really are. You might know them from TV, the big screen, or even the world of sports, but do we really know who they are as a person? Do we know what motivates them? Do we know what inspires them? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Today I had the pleasure of talking to author Joy Smith and her son John, who will share with us a truly incredible story of their own personal miracle. And later in the show, we're going to flash back to an interview with Devon Franklin, who is now adapting their real-life story into a movie. Stay tuned. Walk with us. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thanks a lot, John. I appreciate it. So, I, like I was saying earlier, I, you know, I, I read your book, and I want to just say, like, I envy you. I envy your faith, your devotion to prayer, how strong you are. Like, I don't think I could endure the amount of pain that you went through. Where do you get this strength from? I mean, were you always so deep rooted in your faith? Yes, uh, I grew up in uh, in a home that raised in church. My parents were friends with Oral Roberts parents and my my mom grew up with Oral Roberts and so when I was little I mean if he was in town we went to one of his crusades I can't tell you the many nights I slept on sawdust floors on a blanket and just knew from the very beginning that God did miracles and just was brought up in that type of belief that you know there's nothing that God can't do and so my teenage years uh, weren't so wonderful. <laughs> I decided that um, I knew enough about God that I didn't have to, you know, go to church anymore, and I could kind of do my own thing. And I found out very quickly that uh, that didn't work, <laughs> and uh, basically told my mother that I would walk across the hot coals of hell to be with my boyfriend, which caused lots and lots of problems. Ended up giving up my first child for adoption. I ended up marrying his father and had two more children and which ended in just horrible divorce and at, during that time I decided that life wasn't worth living and so I was going to end it all, it, everybody would be better off without me and uh, God obviously had a different plan and sent my friend over to my house just as I was getting ready to take a bottle of pills. and. She stuck with me for the next week. I went back to church and gave my heart to the Lord, and the Lord just started restoring my life. I mean, it's taken many years to get to that point, but God did it better than I could ever dream. <laughs> and now you, you mentioned, now John, before we get into the story, now John was adopted. Now yes. tell me about that experience, like what type of emotions were, were you going through at that moment? And why did you adopt and not have a... Uh... Natural. My hus my second husband and I, we lost two children right after we first got married. And we were never able to have other children, even though I had two older boys that I brought into the marriage and he treated them like their own. We still wanted a child of our own and was never able to have them. And so um, we decided, he, my husband had gone to Latin America a lot to do uh, building schools for Latin America child care, for, which is part of our denomination's missions trip. Fell in love with the kids while we were down there and so he came home one afternoon and he said, what do you think about adopting? And I said, sure, if I don't have to work anymore and get to stay <laughs> home, I'll sign up for that. So we did and it wasn't an easy road because my mother became very ill and she had to move in with us and she was in the process of dying over the next five months while we were going through the adoption, which was, if it could go wrong, it was going wrong. But uh, finally, we got our date to travel, which was November the 15th, and we'll be celebrating the Gotcha Day uh, this month mm -hmm. for 17 years. And so we traveled to Guatemala and got him. And I don't know what I was expecting, but he was five and a half months old. That, and when they brought him into the hotel, we they lost our luggage, and it was late. It was almost midnight when we finally got to our hotel which was just an adventure in itself. But anyway, they brought him in and handed him to me, and I was like, oh my goodness, what have we got ourselves into? Because here's this little 10-pound, skinny, emaciated little thing. <laughs> but, you know, God just worked it out, and we came home with him, and he just 
transformed our family. I just can't, I mean, from the very beginning, he just transformed our family and brought something new to it and just did a lot of healing, especially for my son, Charles. And they bonded right away and they're still extremely close, so. And now, okay, so now let's let's speed up the story, right? Okay. So now you win the basketball game. It's, you know, you tell your mom you want to celebrate with your friends. And now you said you were a little hesitant about that. You had these sort All of emotions. Long, I did not want him to go. I gave him every excuse that he could possibly have not to go so that he didn't look bad or lose face. But I just had a feeling that he shouldn't go. And as during my years growing up, when I don't listen to those feelings, usually there's a consequence mm -hmm. to them. But I never dreamed that that was going to be the consequence of his accident. And what happened? Can you tell us, John? The night before we won the basketball game, we, uh, went, on, we went to the park. We got bored playing, you know, the typical Xbox, eating, you know. So we went down there and there was this little Ferris wheel. And, uh, you know, we'd take turns. It would be me and one other guy and then we'd swap, it'd be, you know, them and then, you know, do a rotation. And we wanted to see how many times we could spend without puking, passing out, so on and so on. So, <laughs> so we noticed that the lake was frozen and we live in Missouri and it usually never freezes. So we were like, you know, let's go down there and check it out. So we wanted to see how thick it was. So there were some rocks. If this is the dock, there's some rocks over here. So we walked around, got the heaviest rock all three of us could bear. Take it down there and we just drop it. And we wanted to see if it would go through, you know, if, you know, if it'd stay. And it stayed. So we were like, it must be pretty thick. So we put our hands on, our, on the dock and then we put our feet on the ice and, you know, we're sliding them back and forth. And then still nothing happening. So finally we turn, like we're facing the dock and we put our hands on it and we're putting a lot more of our body weight on the ice and we wanted to see if that would, you know, break it and eventually it, it wouldn't give. So I can't tell you who the first one to step on the ice was. I feel like it was a, a joint effort, um, but the three of us got on the ice the night before. And that's where the photo and the book take place of you know me in the Under Armour shirt. That was the night before. The next day, we woke up, we had a good breakfast, and this time we brought Josh Rieger's sister Jamie with us. And, you know, we were doing the same stuff, having fun, listening to music, you know. And if you know me, I, I love the game of basketball. And mom called and wanted to know if I would go to the recplex. And my first answer was, is my dad going? Mm -hmm. Because that's just something we've always shared. So she calls me and I'm on the phone and I'm like, okay, let's do it. You know, because I, I want into scholarship. So uh, she says, I love you, son. And I go, love you, Mom. And I hang the phone up and I fall in. But the thing was, and we didn't piece this together until actually very recently, is when I'm on the phone, I walk and talk. Like, I have to be walking. So, and I wasn't paying attention. So I was on the phone with her, I was walking. And as I was getting farther, the ice was getting thinner. So mm. then we fell in and the three of us, we knew what was gonna happen. If something didn't dramatically change, three of us were gonna die. And now, you know, I've never been in, say, cold water like that. What does it feel like? What did, can you try to describe what it felt like? After the accident and after all the propofol wore off, the nightmare started to come. And to answer your question, it's just, it's a burning sensation. Like, you think you would feel freezing, but instead you feel hot and then the ice cutting your skin, it's just, it's unbearable. It's, it's probably the worst pain you'll ever feel. When you were in the ice before you were rescued, did you have any visions or did you feel like, was there anything going on you, or were you just trying to survive? You know, you see the movies every day of, you know, these things and you never expect it to happen to you. I mean, you think you're just gonna go on with your everyday life. But we, we knew that we were staring death in the face. We knew that very well. And you know, one of the key things in the book is call 911, I don't want to die, call 911. We, we knew to do that. But from then on, we didn't, we didn't know, like, we talked to the firemen afterwards, the key thing is to stay still, but you know, we're, <laughs> we're, our instincts were telling we're us, not get on the ice, get somewhere, get to the dock, but it, it was just so hard to do all that. And now you, you got the call, and, yes. and they said, you know, your son has drowned. 
what were you doing at that exact moment and what was the what was it like for the ride over to the hospital and what did you say to God? It was interesting how God was preparing me because just before the phone rang I had read a devotional that my friend had written and it was talking about depending on God no matter what and and so the minute I finished reading that the phone rang and Cindy gave me the the news and it was like you just go into slow motion it, it's like you can't move fast enough, you can't get around fast enough. Your brain doesn't want to comprehend what's just been told you, you don't want to receive it. And so I'm driving and I'm trying to call people, I'm trying to call my husband, I'm trying to call anyone to tell them what's happened. No one's answering the phone and I'm just in panic, I don't know, it's panic mode or survival mode I guess is a better word. And I just started making sure that God could hear me <laughs> as I was screaming. At, and I wasn't being like irreverent to him. It was like I wanted to make sure that he was listening to what I was saying. And I just kept begging God, please don't take my son, Lord. Just, you know, you gave him to us once. Please don't take him away from us. And so, I mean, that was my prayer all the way over is just calling on the Holy Spirit. You know, I need you now more than I've ever needed you in my whole entire life. And I just knew, I can't tell you that I was calm and collected at that point, but I started getting an assurance that God was going to take care of this, that he was going to work it out. I didn't know how, but I just knew that it was going to be okay. It didn't mean you, that I wasn't upset. It just meant that I started getting an assurance that this was going to happen. What, was you, what type of insurance was it, an assurance? That God would answer my prayer. That I, I can't, okay, I don't want this to sound wrong. I can't ever tell you that there's a time that God has not come in and answered my prayer. Maybe not always like I wanted him to answer it, but he always answered it. He's faithful. That's one of the things I've learned down through the years is God's faithfulness does not depend on our faithfulness to him. He's faithful. That's his character. And so I just knew I had that assurance because of past experiences that God was going to be faithful to this also. And now when you, you arrived at the hospital, how long was your son in the ice for between that time? Would you say? Uh, he was under the water for 15 minutes, probably on the shore for another 10 to 15 minutes, five minute car ride to uh, ambulance ride to the hospital. And at that time they'd been doing CPR on for 27 minutes. So it, the math ends up to be close to an hour. And from the research they've done, what was the average, like what is the amount of time that someone could survive in the water um, at that temperature? They talk about a golden hour, eight to ten minutes after that, then the body and the brain starts slowing down. One of the things that we've read since then is that usually people die from asphyxiation in, when they drown, and so their body will say kind of buoyant. That was not the case with John. John's lungs were full of water, which just t took him and forced him to the bottom of the lake very quickly. And even when they brought him out and they started doing CPR, they said it was like a fountain when they would do CPR. Even once they got him to the hospital and started doing CPR on it, the water was still there. Even days into the hospital, they were still pumping fluid out of his lungs. I mean, wow. that's how much water he had he'd taken on. I know you've heard this probably a million times. How does it make you feel when your mom sort of tells a story? Grateful to be alive. Um, I, I take, you know, we're not promised tomorrow. So, you know, I don't want to live recklessly, but I live with knowing that I serve a great God. You know, he gave me a second chance. And I try to live to just not, uh, not be, like, well, I guess be a walking proof that he's still out there. You know, in today's world with all the chaos, you know, this is a hope story. And I'm not saying I'm the next great hope. I'm saying that God still does miracles and God can still do the impossible. I agree. And throughout the story, I mean, we see that the Holy Spirit was present. I mean, yes. with Tom, who rescued you, to uh, Keith, who yeah. continued to do the yes. CPR. Do you think that was sort of attributed to the prayer? Like, why was, why was the Holy Spirit around you? One of the scriptures that we hung on to through this was Jeremiah 29, 11. And if you look back through... We call this a tapestry of miracles, how God just put people in place, how from the first responders doing cold water retrieval practice four days before the accident in the exact same place where John went down. I mean, that wasn't an accident. 
uh, the fact that Tommy heard someone tell him where John was. I mean, the Holy Spirit, God had already crafted this because he knew what was coming. I mean, this is, God never goes to plan B. It's always plan A because the scripture tells us that he knows the beginning from the end. He knew us before he put us in our mother's womb. And so he already had this planned out and I feel like you know, God was going, okay, I need you here, I need you here, I need you here. You know, that's just how it is. God had put people in place and the Holy Spirit was just there leading and guiding things the way he wanted things to go. So do you think that from the drowning, from the do you think from the adoption to the drowning to the miracle that this was all part of God's plan? Yes, absolutely. I, you'd never convince me any other way, yes. So do you have any regrets on that night, uh, you know, no. allowing him to go? No. God always knows better. <laughs> Like I said, I've prayed for many things and God and wanted him to answer them one way and he's come in and answered them his way and it's always the best way. So, I mean, just to see this play out over the almost three years now, I sit back in awe and watch as God opens up doors that we never, when looking to, to write a book, God brought that to us and he continues to do it. So just the last question for, um, a lot of people are skeptical about the power of prayer. What would you say to them? Don't let common sense and logic come in and dictate your faith because God, number one, isn't logical to us. And the scripture says that his ways are not our ways. Don't limit him. Don't put him in a box and not let him do the things in your life that he wants to do. I agree. And, and just the last question for you, John, is why do you think God chose you? I don't know. I don't. People ask me all the time, you know, are you, are you special? Are you like a mute or something? I'm like, no, I'm just a 17 year old kid from Missouri. You know, um, Jeremiah 29 11. He's got a plan for me and all I can do is let him drive and I'll ride. And what do you think the ultimate plan is? I want to become a pastor one day. And it took me a while to realize that I was really stubborn about it, but now that I'm kind of opening my mind to what he is in store, I don't know where he's going to lead me, but I'm sure you're going to try and find out. Yeah, well, I'm interested to find out as well. I mean, th thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you guys. It was thank wonderful you. meeting you. It's awesome. Appreciate thank you so it. much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. As a doctor, do you see conflict between faith and some of your medical training? Quite the opposite. As a physician, you face on the front lines uh, the health problems that people are experiencing, and they need support. Now, a lot of times, patients are not sure how to get it. Mm -hmm. But as a physician, I think you're obligated to realize that for a lot of folks, faith is a path that they should be tapping into. So I've seen the role that it's played in my own patients. I've talked about it on the show from day one, and I'm I'm feeling blessed that I got the blessed 30 <laughs> partnership <laughs> with Devon here. <laughs> Grateful to help out. And now what motivates you, Devon? You know, what motivates me is, is people. That at the end of the day, you know, no matter what I, I do, it's all about how can the person, whether they're reading a book that I've written, watching mm -hmm. movies that I've produced, or even seeing me on Dr. Rock, how can they become better? Because life, it's hard. I mean, come on, people are living these lives and every moment there's something that's telling you you're not good enough, you're never gonna live your dreams, you know, shut up and just be happy with what you got. Mm -hmm. And so when you watch programming like this, the goal is to wake you up. Yeah. And I exist to help wake people up and put them on a path, hopefully, that can be better for their life. I think you're doing that. Now, one thing, um, Dr. Oz, is a lot of people claim that prayer has the ability to sort of cure or, or even affect the body. Is that, have you experienced that? Have you seen that in your own sort of, in your own, uh, some of your patients? So I've, I've seen prayer used in settings, for example, I, I remember vividly two patients who were getting mechanical heart pumps, mm -hmm. which is what I grew up doing at New York Presbyterian. And one patient had his wife with him all the time. She was praying with him, reading to him, just with him. And whether it was belief or belonging, she, that woman never left him, and he felt that. And the other patient who was equally sick, both of them, by the way, should have passed, never had anyone visit him. Wow. He ended up melting into the bed. Literally, he couldn't have been after a while identified that he was there because he just lost all love. Mm. Uh, he lost the, the hope that comes along with faith so frequently. And the other gentleman survived, wow. the one who shouldn't wow. have. So I've seen it firsthand, but it's much bigger than that. I've done clinical trials, big ones, looking at the role of, of prayer and healing. And the reality is we have a very simplistic view sometimes of, of what faith's mm -hmm. offering us. Because I can't just pray that you'll live. Mm -hmm. I need to pray that thy will be done. Mm. And who the heck knows 
what the answer to that is. <laughs> I definitely don't. So it's hard wow. to predict what's supposed to happen. I just know that it brings great solace to patients, which is why so many patients rely on it. And we know folks uh, who have faith in themselves seem to do better in many, mm -hmm. many settings. That research is decades old. That's, a, that's amazing. Now, do you believe that you're following God's plan? Do you believe that the gifts you have are from God? Oh, absolutely. I believe that every gift that I have is from God, especially with, you know, the unique things that God has me doing specifically in entertainment. You know, I started in entertainment 20 years ago and used to be an executive uh, for Columbia Pictures and now we're my own production company. Uh, but to be able to do that and to write books and to be on television and to have these great opportunities, mm -hmm. It's only from God. It's, it's completely not of my ability or my strength or my intellect. It only has to do with being a vessel for whatever he, whatever he wants to do in any given moment. Now, how do you know, like say, because I mean, I know in my own personal life, like I'll hear voices. How do I distinguish or determine if it's God's voice or if it's mm -hmm. my own sort of self-motivation, my own self-desires? Mm -hmm. How do you, how could somebody, how does somebody know? You know, one, it begins with listening. And I, what I like to do is I like to write down what I hear. Mm -hmm. I like to write down and say, okay, God, uh, I'm feeling something, I think I'm hearing something, is this you? Mm -hmm. And then I begin to look for confirmation. Mm -hmm. And what is surprising to me is that when you write down what you hear and then you look for the signs, you begin to get confirmation. And that is how I begin to listen to God's voice. The other thing is reading the Word. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a relationship with Him, you will know His voice. The Bible says that. My children will know my voice. So when you're in the Word and you pray and you make sure you're communicating with Him, you're going to hear it. I mean, there have been things, you know, God said, quit your job. And, and one of the signs was... <laughs> I said, okay, Lord, you want me to quit my job? Now, we're talking, this is a good job, right? You know, you know hey, we're making know. good money. It's, it's a good profile, all this. But then I said, okay, what are the signs? And I could see that the environment corporately was changing, yeah. that the power structure was shifting, and that what I was doing, the way I was doing it, wasn't going to be available to me that much longer. Mm. And so, but here's the thing. Here's the scary part. Faith requires us to do something. Mm -hmm. And that's where we miss it. Faith without works is dead. So what my works had to be is I had to go into the chairman of Sony Pictures office and tell her I'm quitting. <laughs> I want to start my company. I want you to set it up. I didn't know what she was going to say, yeah. but you got to put it in action. Of so that's the thing that we're hoping this programming will do is motivate action. How do I get control of my life? How do I get control of my faith? And how do I begin to realize that God has a plan? Mm -hmm. I just need to put, make sure I'm participating in it. Now, one other question. Now, how would you define sin? And have you ever been, I know you worked in Hollywood, have you ever been in a situation where you had to make decisions that went against your belief system? Yeah, I define sin as, you know, an offense against God. You know, an offense against what He's called us to do and, and, and who He's called us to be. And, the, you know, the laws and principles that He's put in the Word that we may choose to go against. Or sometimes it happens overtly, sometimes it happens inadvertently. So for me being in Hollywood, I love this question. Because so many people think that just because it's Hollywood, mm -hmm that the walk I've had to walk is different. Not so. Yeah. You could be in ministry and you still have the same temptations in ministry that you have in Hollywood because mm -hmm. this temptation comes from your desire. Mm -hmm. I can't be tempted by what I don't want to do. Yep. I can only be tempted by what I want. And my ambition can put me in a position where I'm very tempted to do a lot of things. We can be tempted to do a lot of things that may work against us. So for me, what I've had to manage, number one, in order to not fall into that trap, is manage what I wanted. Mm -hmm. and challenge myself on why I wanted it. So Hollywood just may be the megaphone for that yeah. experience, but it's no different. And the way that I've tried to navigate it is at every step, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Do you want me to do this? Do you want me to do this project? Do you want me to handle this movie? And there have been movies where I have said, I'm not gonna work on it. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just, I can't add any value to that because that doesn't align with what I wanna put in the world. And guess what? I didn't get fired for it. They just began to bring me the type of movies I could do. And what came out of that? Heaven is for real. Mm -hmm. Miracles from heaven. Amazing. You can find a path if you search it, search for it, no matter what you believe. And one thing now, you're very outspoken about your faith. Now, do you think, especially in Hollywood, a lot of people don't sort of identify with the faith. Do you think, do you know why? Is there a reason behind that? And do you think that through your actions in the show that you'll be able to inspire other people to speak out about their faith? You know, I, I think that one, as, as people of faith, I think one of the things that I try to do, and I think it's important, is have empathy. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, all, we're all trying to figure life out. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the truth. We're all trying to figure out who are we? Why are we put here? What am I supposed to do? So for even those who may not share the same belief system, you know, I empathize and say, hey, I understand. We're all trying to do this, and I'm not going to present myself as, oh, holier than mm -hmm. thou. 
because I have a belief, this belief system and you don't. That's, no, I don't do that. You know, Paul says I become who I need to become to reach them, which means I get on their level, I empathize. And I think what's so important about being in Hollywood is that you have an opportunity to partner with so many different types of people. And so you talk about, we're on, doctor, we're on the Dr. Oz set, we're here, okay? <laughs> and so to be able to have this conversation and to touch lives and to change hearts and maybe change minds and maybe save someone from how they would have done something differently, that's the real opportunity of all this. And Dr. Oz, what do you think the ultimate plan is for your life? Uh, you know, I've you always lived my life listening to the calling. I went into medicine, which is still, I think, my primary love in life because I realized I had the opportunity to do things for people that sometimes they didn't know they needed to have done but they'd respect me for it. And ultimately, we both loved the experience and I felt fulfilled every day that I start the show every morning remembering what it was like to practice medicine full time. I still operate one day a week, but it reminds me because we structurally do it almost always the same way. So this is a calling for me. I believe that I have the opportunity to help folks and I'm blessed to be friends with people who have talents and skill sets that I don't have. And if I can just listen well enough to people who have insights, you talked about the five H's today. Yeah. The, the H, the last one is humble. Yeah, That's humility. the most important one. If you mm. have some humility, then you listen to people, they'll tell you where to go. And my calling mm. is to make sure I pay attention to those voices. Mm. That's great. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Always remember, we have the ability to inspire and evangelize through our words and actions. Till next time, thanks for walking with us.